chapter 26 today. I, uh, I want to share, I, 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 I've saved a, certain, a couple for a Resurrection Sunday. Okay. <clears throat> Three friends from the local congregation were asked, when you're in your casket and friends and congregation members are mourning over you, what would you like them to say? Artie said, I would like them to say I was a wonderful husband, a, a fine spiritual leader, and a great family man. Eugene commented, I, I would like them to, to, to say I was a wonderful teacher and servant of God who made a huge difference in people's lives. Al said, I'd like them to say, look, he's moving. I liked it. I... I'm weighing this one out. Can I share this one with this group? A man, his wife, and his mother-in-law went on vacation to the Holy Land. While they were there, the mother-in-law passed away. An undertaker told them, you can have her shipped home for $5,000, or you can bury her here in the Holy Land for 150. The man thought about it and told him he would just have her, like to have her shipped home. The undertaker asked, why? Why would you spend $5,000 to ship your mother-in-law home when it would be wonderful to have her buried here and only spend $150? The man said, a man died 2,000 years ago. He was buried here, and three days later, he rose from the dead. I just can't take that chance. <sighs> Don't judge me. Today, I, I want to share with you about something that happened to me in early January of this year. It was kind of a breakdown. That, that might be an awkward way to start a Resurrection Sunday, and, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. But today, you know, we are celebrating some really good news. And, and this message is for you today if you're feeling discouraged, if you're feeling overwhelmed, or, or, or if you're tired of everything feeling out of control. You, you might be someone who has a lot of anxiety or, or, or fear uh, or maybe just uncertainty about the future. The title of this message is When Things Feel Out of Control. Now the subtitle of this message is Sweet Surrender. So Father, on this Resurrection Sunday, as we celebrate your son, Jesus, we ask that your resurrection power, the, the, the power that's available to us would conquer every fear that we have. For all those, Lord, who feel like things are, are out of control, may they find the blessing today uh, of full surrender to your son, Jesus, our King, our Savior. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to be talking today from Matthew 26, but I want to try to set the context for you. This is before the crucifixion. The setting is the Lord's Supper. Jesus is gathered with his closest friends. These are people that he has been doing life with for three and a half years. They have actually been with him day and night for three and a half years. And, and now they're gathered around a table. Jesus is having this very heartfelt conversation with them, knowing, that, knowing what was to come and the agony that he would endure on the cross. Now, for 33 years, Jesus has been obedient to the Father. He's never gone against the Father's will. But he's, he's aware of the, of the torture 
that is about to come. And at that moment, around the table, he's talking with his disciples with the full knowledge that, that one of his close friends was about to betray him. And he took bread and he, and he broke it. And, and I, I can just imagine the emotion that he, that he was feeling as he said, this, this bread represents my body, which is about to be broken for you. Then he held up a cup of wine and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant. This represents my blood, which is about to be shed for you. Whenever you gather together in the years to come, do this in remembrance of me. Now, I, I need for you to understand that Jesus knew what was coming. Jesus was aware of what he was about to endure. Then he took his disciples with him to a place called Gethsemane. Now, the word Gethsemane means oil press or, or crushing. And he said to his closest friends, you guys sit here and pray for a while while I go and talk to the Father. Jesus needed some intimate time with his Father. And then he said these words in Matthew 26, verse 38. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. I, I don't know what's going on in your life. You might say, well, I, I'm overwhelmed with anxiety or, or, or exhaustion. Or I'm overwhelmed with stuff. I, I'm just balancing too many things. I'm trying to keep too many plates spinning at the same time. But Jesus used the strongest possible metaphor. He said, my soul is overwhelmed to the point of death. Now, another gospel writer tells us that when he was sweating, that his sweat was mixed with blood. He was in agony. So going a distance away from his disciples, he, he fell on his face to the ground. Now, as I visualize that, I don't see him just falling on his face. I see him falling to his knees first and then on his face and praying and talking to the Father. And this was his prayer, Matthew 26, verse 39. Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Now, the cup that he was describing was the cup of suffering. What, what, I'm, what I've called you to endure during the next many hours, what I'm called to endure during the next many hours, would you remove that from me? I, I don't want to go through that. I know what's coming, Father. I'm overwhelmed to the point of death. Please take this cup from me if, if it's possible. Then he says, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Now, I, I want to call our attention to two words. The word if and the word nevertheless. If it's possible. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Then he returned to his disciples and he found them sleeping. Now, I, I, I can't help but when I read the scriptures, especially stories, I can't help but imagine what's happening in my mind. And I, I, I guess in my mind I see Jesus coming back and saying, guys, I, I gave you one job. Stay awake and pray. And you can't do that. Now, in their defense, Sometimes it's difficult to stay awake when you're praying, especially when you're really tired. Who hasn't fallen asleep praying? I know I have. So Jesus has come back and he, 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 sa he says, I, I, I need you to be with me in this. 
Stay awake and watch. I, I, I gave you one job, uh, and they let him down. Now, what's interesting is Jesus could raise the dead. He could heal the sick. He could calm the storm. He could cleanse the leper, but he couldn't control his own disciples. Just an observation. Now, I'm curious today, how many of you like to be in control? Now, I, I don't need a, a show of hands <laughs> because I actually know that we're all control freaks at one level or another. And, and as I was preparing this message, I was thinking about the last three years, how challenging it was for people who like to be in, in control. I, I was thinking about the, the emotional disorientation people were experiencing two and three years ago. There was frustration. There was anxiety. Many were, were, had an overwhelming sense of fear. And, and, and also, maybe a real sense of grieving. Now, when I say grieving, I'm not just talking about the people that were lost in that season. I mean, we lost Raymond, our, our beloved Raymond. We, we lost Olga. That, that was hard. The, the loss of people is always impacts us. But when I say grieving, I, I'm not talking about that. I, I'm not even talking about grieving the jobs that were lost or the opportunities that were lost, the money that was lost. Those are all very real. But what I'm talking about is that many of us were grieving a loss of control an inability to make things happen the way we want them to happen. All of a sudden, we couldn't do many of the things that we were used to being able to do. Uh, the, the list was innumerable. You know, I, I used to be able to go to the movies when I wanted to, and now I can't. I, I had my wedding planned, and now... I can't even invite anybody. I used to go to sporting events, and now I can't. I, I had a vacation planned, and I couldn't go. You couldn't even go out to dinner with your friends. Remember the whole restaurant takeout season? Um, that, that would not have been my choice. Now, there are certain places I do like takeout, in fact, I experienced something very traumatic on uh, Friday evening. James knows about it. I went over to his house to help with some computer stuff. My plan was, I really loved the, the round table sandwiches at the Blue. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Wow. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I love them. And uh, my plan was, as soon as I got done, I was going to order a sandwich at the Blue, pick it up, and head home. And, and for some reason, they, were, they, they weren't taking orders to go. And uh, James tried to calm me down. <laughs> but, you know, we like for things to happen like we want them to happen. We like for things to go the way we plan them. You know, during that season, Mickey couldn't even go and visit her mom, who, who was living in the Odd Fellows uh, Center. The only time that she could visit her mom was when her mom had an emergency and had to go to the hospital, and she could go and connect with her face-to-face -face in that kind of a situation. We, were, we, were, we had this hunger and this desire to gather, and yet... We were forced to isolate. How many remember that? To people who like to be in control, and when things you're unable to do the things that you want to do, that can be very challenging. And, and the, the most devastating thing of all in that season, some of you ladies couldn't even get your nails done. That was meant as a joke. 
Well, you couldn't, you couldn't, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you couldn't get that perm? Some of you would go to Walmart and couldn't even buy toilet paper. Do you remember that? Grieving the loss of control. Most of us are control freaks. But here's the truth. The, the more that we try to control things, the more we become afraid that we are losing control. And so we try all the harder to control things, and the more we do that, the more afraid we are of, of losing control. And this cycle perpetuates in our lives. Jesus offers us a prayer before God that reveals the most powerful words of surrender that I'm aware of. If it's possible, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. He, he goes to check on his disciples. They're asleep. He wakes them up, and, he, and then he goes back to the Father again. I'm reading verse 42. Again, a second time, he went and prayed, saying, now before we read his prayer, we're going to see that surrender is not always a one-time event. Sometimes we have to go to, back to God. J Jesus got, goes a second time to the Father, and he prays, Oh, my Father, if this cup cannot pass from me unless I drink it, your will be done. Everyone say if. Yeah. If we could do it a different way, God, I would love to do it a different way. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Everyone say nevertheless. nevertheless. To those of, of us that struggle with a sense of lack of control, and I'm talking to all of my fellow control freaks, I hope you'll embrace this truth. In your notes, you don't always have the power to control, but you do always have the power to surrender. You and I don't always have the, the power or the ability to control everything, but we do always have the power to surrender. During the last two and three years, did you ever ask the question, where is God in all of this? Did God cause this? Is this punishment for something that someone did? Did God allow this? Is God going to use this? What, can I trust God in the middle of this? Where is God when life is hard? And life can be hard. I'm not trying to shock anybody. But life can be difficult. How many have heard this expression? Life is hard, but God is good. You know, there, there really is some truth to that because life can many times begin to happen apart from the, the, our plan and our purpose, or our, let me say it this way, the, the things that we purpose or the way we plan for things to happen, things can go very different than that. And it can be very challenging for us. Now, I, I, I think that expression, life is hard, but God is good, I, I, I don't think most of us want to embrace that hard part. I mean, life should be easy, smooth sailing, trouble-free. I mean, if you're doing it right, we shouldn't have any difficulty. Life should be simple and easy. Really? Interesting. You know, researchers recently did some studies about the belief system of the younger generation. Now, when I say younger generation, I, I'm thinking 18, well, I'm not thinking, this was what the Serbia was, ages 18 through 25. Do you know what the default religion in the U.S. for this age group is? It's MTD. MTD stands for Moralistic Therapeutic Deism. 
Now, let me explain what that means. Uh, this is the default belief system in general for a, a person in that age group today. This is what it means. Moralistic. Uh, a person who is moralistic, they equate religion with being good, moral, and nice. It means to be generally a good person. You're not just living for yourself. You're, you're, you're going to help other people, and you're going to be a moral person. Now, therapeutic, in this belief system, faith is a means to improve your life. Religion should make your life better. If I surrender my life to God, it should be better. It should be easy and trouble-free. Now, deism, this has to do with the concept of God. Now, in this belief system, God is real, but he's not really involved in your life unless you really need him. Like he's there, but he's not going to get involved in your daily activities unless something pretty drastic happens. So, to summarize, the belief the default belief system among this emerging generation of young people, it's this. An emotionally uninvolved God exists to make our lives better. So I, I go to church or I read my version Bible app or I, or I do something good, I, I help someone in need. So my faith in God should make me have a happy, healthy, comfortable, trouble-free life. Now, the problem <laughs> with that belief system is this. If God wants me happy, and I'm not, either God failed or I did something wrong. If God wants my life to be better, easy, and trouble-free, and suddenly I have obstacles and troubles, then either God's not really good, God let me down, or, or I screwed up something, along the way. This is why some people say, well, I, you know, I tried religion. I, I tried prayer. I went to church online once. I, I, I tried church, and it didn't work. Life was still hard. I, I tried to be a Christian. I tried to be spiritual, but my life was still difficult. I mean, what if I, if I do surrender to God's will, and, and he makes me stay single for five more years. Well, what if I, I, if, I, if I try to surrender to God, if I try to live a moral life, and he doesn't heal my migraines instantly? What, what, what if, what if I'm, I'm seeking God, and he doesn't make my marriage enter any better? My husband's still a demoniac. He has at least five demons. That was supposed to be a little hilarious. Only five? Yeah. <laughs> Come out of him right now. Oh, wait a minute, it did. What, what if I'm pressing into God? What if I'm seeking God and I'm still walking through some difficulties? I hope that we understand that God's will is rarely easy, but it's always good. It's rarely ever easy, but it's always good. Sometimes it might not feel good at the moment, but all things are working together for our good because we love God and we are called according to to his purpose. It wasn't easy at all for Jesus as the cross was approaching. The will of God was not easy for him. In fact, speaking about not easy, let's talk about Jesus' mom first, okay? Think about this for a minute. Gabriel appears to Mary, <clears throat> tells her she's going to have a son, and how great and amazing this son was going to be. Well, that's, that's pretty exciting, but, but she was confused as to how that could happen. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
because she's never known a man. She was a virgin. Gabe says the, the Holy Spirit is going to come on you and make it happen. And one of the last things he says to her are these words. Luke chapter 1, verse 37. For with God, nothing will be impossible. How many have ever heard that verse before? Seven of you. We need to focus on this scripture. You know, this was one of the first verses that I memorized as, as a young Christian. I thought it was great. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Some translations so say, for nothing will be impossible with God. You know, I've had a relationship with this verse of scripture for about 50 years. But did you know that is a very inaccurate translation of that verse? Father, I take it back. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I've looked in, in translation after translation, and they all translate it wrong. I've even checked Spanish translations, especially when I was just heading to Mexico, to see if they were better. Now, I'm not trying to put myself out as a Greek scholar. I, I studied Greek when I went for my bachelor in theology. But see, apart from that, anyone can look at a Greek concordance. The Greek of that verse has the word rhema in it. The word rhema is translated word everywhere else in the New Testament. Why can't you find the word word in any translation of this verse? For with God, nothing will be impossible. For nothing will be impossible with God. Where is the word word? Now, the New American Standard references it in its footnotes and tells us that he literally said, no word from God will be impossible. Now, see, when Gabriel said this to Mary, in essence, he was saying every word that comes from God suddenly becomes possible. The moment that God speaks it, every word from God comes with the power to fulfill itself. It carries, it self-carries the power to bring it to pass. Now, see, that's what Isaiah 55, 11 is trying to tell us. God says, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. Isaiah 55, 11, James. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Or in other words, God is saying, I release it with power, and it will do what I say. The power to fulfill is in the word. Now, Mary said, I don't understand how this could happen. I'm a virgin. And what Mary heard Gabriel say was this. The Holy Spirit is going to come on you. And no word from God is without the power to fulfill itself. And see, that's what she heard. And so she responded perfectly to that. Her response could not have been more perfect. She said, be it unto me according to your word. She just bowed before the authority of the word, recognizing that it came with the power to make it happen. It came with the power to fulfill itself. As she bowed before and received the word, she was receiving the power to make it happen. Are you getting this? Now, I remember when I first started understanding this. I suddenly realized that God wanted me healed more than I did. And that he had gone to great lengths to release that healing to my life, to make it available. <coughs> I realized 
that the power to heal was in his word. I didn't have to wrestle with God and try to talk him into doing something he said. I just needed to recognize that this is what God said. That is the will of God. It comes with the power to fulfill itself. If I embrace the word, I receive the power. It's already in the word. I can just bow before the authority of his word. I'm surrendering to the authority of what God is saying. How does God make things happen? He speaks. God said, light be, and light was. How does God heal us? Psalm 107, verse 20. He sent his word and healed them. How did he do it? He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. You don't have to struggle and strive to get healed. In fact, that will actually kind of hinder it. I just need to surrender to it. Be it unto me according to your word. I bow before the authority of your word, God. May your will be done in my life. I surrender. Faith is easy when you know what God's will is. And isn't that what the Bible says? This is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, we know that he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, we know that we will have the petition that we have desired of him. The key is, is knowing what God's will is. And see, God's will is released through his word. God doesn't say one thing and will another. His word, it stands true. He never changes his mind. He doesn't repent. He doesn't change the way he thinks. And he declares the truth of his word, and it stands forever. Amen. We can build our lives on the truth of this book, and it will stand the test of time. In fact, it's the only thing that will stand the test of time because heaven and earth will pass away, but his word abides Forever. Forever. Now we're talking about Mary surrendering to God's will. Now, it, it, it's not going to be easy. In fact, do you have any idea the rumors that went around concerning Mary? A supposed virgin who suddenly became pregnant. God's will is not, not always the easy way. Joseph was going to privately break off his, her, his engagement with her, but because of an encounter that he had with God, they got married, and she gave birth to Jesus and some more children after him, and she raised him, but still lived with Rumors. But remember, she also got to see her son stripped naked and suffer for sins he never committed. She watched her son breathe his last breath on the cross. She couldn't do anything to stop it. In your notes, God's will is not always easy, but it's always good. Jesus never wronged anyone. He was completely without sin, holy and perfect in every way. He was, he was betrayed by one of his own, handed over, beaten without mercy. They forced him to carry his own cross, pounded stakes into his hands and feet. They spit on him and cursed him. They hung him on a cross. They hung this innocent man who did nothing but show love. Now, I actually believe that Jesus did have the power to take control. I believe he could have called a legion of angels. He could have taken control, but instead he surrendered. 
And what did Jesus do when the creation was mocking the creator? When they mocked him on the cross, he looked up into heaven and he prayed, Father, forgive them. They don't, they don't know what they're doing. And ultimately, he said, it is finished. It's accomplished. I have done what you have sent me to do. And in the ultimate act of surrender, Jesus said, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he gave up his life for us. And everything went dark. And the earth shook. The disciples scattered. God's will is not always easy. But also, the temple veil ripped from the top to the bottom, declaring that a way into the holy of holies was made for mankind. And three days later, God showed that his will is always good. Mickey read about it earlier in, in the service when some ladies arrived to check on the tomb, the stone that was meant to protect the body of Jesus from any kind of intruders was rolled aside. And when they looked inside the tomb, the body of Jesus was not there because God raised him from the dead. He defeated death and hell and the grave. Before there was salvation for us, there was the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. It wasn't easy, but God is good. Why did God do this? Why did he allow this to happen so that anyone, including everyone hearing these words today, here or on, and online, so that anyone could call upon the name that is above every name, the name that every knee will bow before and every tongue will confess him Lord. And when you call on his name, he forgives you. He heals your brokenness. He removes your shame. And your life is transformed. And it won't just be a, a better version of you. It will be a completely new <laughs> version of you. The old is gone. The new has come. Because of the amazing grace and goodness of God. God will do something for you that you could never do for yourself. You could never save yourself. You could never be good enough. You could never be holy or righteous enough. And that's why God sent Jesus, who was without sin. He became sin for us on the cross. He shed his innocent blood so that we could be forgiven. So that we could become hope dealers, love spreaders, and light givers. That's who you are. <coughs> Excuse me. All of that because of the grace of Jesus. You don't always have the power to control, but you do always have the power to surrender. The question is this, what are you trying to control? That God wants you to surrender. What are you trying to control that God wants you to let go of, to surrender? Is it a relationship? That, that, that person just needs to do what I want them to do. <clears throat> Is it your health or, or the health of a loved one? Is it your finances, uh, your future? What are you trying to control that's not really yours to control? Your kids? One of the things that I, I'm realizing is that there's no such thing as partial surrender. God, I, I surrender this area to you, but I'm, I'm hanging on to all this other stuff. I, I'm 85% surrendered to Jesus. 
But see, the truth is, we're either surrendered or we aren't. We can't say, well, God, I, I, I trust you with some things, but I won't trust you with all things. <coughs> I, I give you all these things, but I'm not going to trust you with my kids. Well, I, I want to control my kids. I, I trust you to get me to heaven, but I'm, I'm not going to trust you with my finances. I'm not going to honor you with the tithe and trust you to meet my needs. I'm keeping my finances under my control. The key is found in two words in the text that we read earlier with Jesus praying. These two words are incredibly important. The words are if and nevertheless. If it's possible, take this cup away. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Real faith starts between the if and the nevertheless. If, if you give me a job with, with benefits, if you can let me marry that person, if you can do what I want to do, what I want you to do, God, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. We don't always have the power to control, but we always have the power to surrender. So here's the problem. <clears throat> Everything in our culture today, it, it invites us, it lures us to live in a way that's contrary to the gospel. It says, you take control, you be in charge, you make it happen, you go for it, get the most out of life. And yet Jesus says these words to us in Matthew 10, 39. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. In other words, to really follow Jesus is to surrender control. Surrendering control of my time, my finances, my relationships, all the things that I steward. Let me tell you about my breakdown. In early January of this year, I went through something unlike anything I've ever experienced. I was planning this trip to Mexico that, that Mickey and I have been to and back. I, I was planning things related to grace. There were some personal things happening. And suddenly, I, I felt overwhelmed. And, and I'm not really sure why, because I usually do have a, a number of things on my plate. But I, I felt this. something that I've never experienced before. I felt it physically, and I felt it mentally. I felt like my body was shutting down. I didn't feel like being active at all. I, I just felt like sitting. I've got a really comfortable chair at home. Who else has a really comfortable chair? We might have to have an altar call. I have this really comfortable chair in my office, and it's, I can just kick back in it. And that's what I felt like doing, just kind of vegging out. And at the same time that was, that, that was happening, there was something mentally happening to me also. And I actually was, I found myself kind of forgetful about events and details. It was like my brain was in a fog and kind of shutting down. It was kind of alarming. Now, I've been in ministry for decades, but I've never had anything like this, quite like this happen before. I even thought, maybe it's time to retire. Maybe that's what's going on here. And so I began to share with Mickey how I was feeling, and I think it was a little alarming for her, too. Uh, she said, you know, you need to get together with Hugh Laybourne. See, after I got saved, my, my first real pastor was Hugh Laybourne, and you know, I was, I was totally willing to get together with him. It's been a while. I miss him. I, I would love to do that. But we were, as a church, just heading into a week of prayer and fasting. And as we headed into that week, 
I realized that things were just kind of out of control in my life, which is a challenging thing for a control freak to experience. And I'm speaking to the choir because we're all control freaks. Or maybe I should just say, is there anybody here that's not a control freak? Rick raises his hand. But did you notice that when Rick raised his hand, Sarah's hand went over and slapped him. <laughs> I thought you weren't a control freak. <laughs> now, I, I guess I, I didn't realize maybe how important control was to me. Now, prior to this experience, <coughs> Uh, I was just, you know, I, I like, I guess we all like to have things in order and stuff like that. And that we headed into this week of prayer and fasting, and I, I had this moment with the Lord of surrender. Like, I can't control these things. They are beyond my control. Lord, I surrender it all to you. It's, it's all in your hands. And I came out of this time of surrender I guess, with an assignment from God. That is to do what I can do and then to surrender everything else. In other words, any place that I can add value or that I can make a difference, I'm going to initiate and move forward in. But things that I don't seem to have time to embrace or anything that I can't control, which how many of you know is most things, I'm going to surrender control. And here's what I found. Surrender is not a one-time thing. Surrender is a daily choice. And I have discovered that, that God can do more with my surrender than he can with my control. You don't always have the power to control, but you always have the power to surrender. About two to three days into the, our week of prayer and fasting, after that time of, of surrendering to God, I really don't know how to describe it. I, the, 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 the way I've, 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 the only way I know to describe it is it's like God breathed on me. And, and he gave me a word when I was just innocently reading my Bible in January. I'm always in the book of Genesis. And I was just innocently reading a passage of scripture that God has spoken to me about before, but this time it just came alive. And and that's, uh, I believe it was a word for me personally, but also for us as a church. And I'm talking about the Lift Up Your Eyes series that I preached. And see, when God breathed on me, it just lifted me out of that place that I was in, I actually can't even remember what it felt like. I just know the words I used to describe it to my wife with, and that's how I describe it to you, by using those words. But I'm not there. And I can't even remember quite what that felt like. I knew it was awful. That's what I remember. To those of you that are are trying so hard to be in control, and and you just don't know how, to let go. You, you may be 20 inches or so away from full surrender. 20 inches from knowing the peace that is on the other side of surrender. Now, you might be thinking that I'm talking about the 20 inches between your head and your heart, but I'm actually talking about somewhere else on your anatomy. I'm talking about the 20 inches between your knees and the floor. When you want to be in control, You stand strong and hard. But when you surrender, you bend your knees and cry out to God. Just as Jesus did at Gethsemane. His soul was overwhelmed to the point of death. And he knelt down before the Father And he displayed the greatest faith between the F and the nevertheless. If you can, if you will, please do. Nevertheless, I trust you. Real faith starts between the F 
and the nevertheless. As a pastor, I, I carry you as a flock in my heart. I, I care about each and every one of you. And I, I want so much for you to not be impacted by the fear that is in the world today. I, I want so much for you not to be distracted from the intim intimacy with the Father. I, I don't want you to lose the things in the Spirit that keep you strong. So what will I do? Well, I'll do what I can. I'll preach the gospel. I'll share what the Bible says about things that are going on around us. And I will pray in great faith for all of you. But ultimately, what I will do is I will release you to him. Because God can do more through our surrender than he can through our control. Whatever you're trying to control that isn't yours to control, give it to him. His will is not always easy, but he is, he's always good. Jesus suffered. He died. But, but then God raised him from the dead. And because of that, I can worship my good, good father. You, you don't always have the power to control, but you always have the power to surrender. Guess what? That's the main message today. I, I, and I know you're getting it because I've said it over and over again. So, Father, right now as we celebrate the resurrection of your Son, would you invade our hearts and our lives with the resurrection power of Jesus Christ, with the grace that goes beyond our ability to understand. If you're here today, or even listening online, and you're recognizing your inability to control things, it might be a relationship, it might be your health, your finances, your job, whatever it is, but whatever you're trying to control, that God wants you to surrender, I, I invite you in this moment to bow in your heart before the Lord. I, I'm inviting you to surrender it to him. Just say, God, I offer this to you. Th this relationship, th this fear, I surrender. Father, we acknowledge that life can be difficult at times. But you work in all those things to bring about good in our lives because we love you and because we're called according to your purpose. We surrender, God. We surrender. Let's stand together. I want to invite the worship team to come. Thank you, Lord. Anyone listening today, if you don't have God's peace, if you don't understand, let me just try to tell you, God is so good, and he loves you so much, but he didn't shout his love down from heaven. That, that was not the method that he used. He showed us his love on earth through his son, Jesus Christ who was without sin, perfect in every way. He was obedient to his heavenly Father, and he laid down his life. He gave his life on the cross. He became sin. God poured out his wrath on him, and he died as the Lamb of God, paying the price for our sins. And see, here's the amazing news. Jesus didn't stay dead. On the third day, he, he rose again. God rolled the stone away, raised Jesus from the dead so that anyone, go ahead and turn off the pad, James, so that anyone, and see, that includes everyone, anyone who calls upon his name will be saved and forgiven, made new. 
So I just want to invite you this morning. If you would say, God, I want your grace. I want your forgiveness. I want to let go of my past. I, I want to surrender my shame. Surrender anything that keeps you from him. And just say this, Jesus, I give you my life. Thank you, Lord. When you call upon him, he hears your prayer and he makes you brand new, a new creation in Christ. So just pray this with me this morning. Heavenly Father, forgive me. Save me. Change me. Jesus, be my Savior. Be my leader. Fill me with your Spirit so I can know your love. I want to walk in your truth. I surrender my life completely to you. Let's just worship the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. There's no burden he can't carry. There's no life he can't redeem.
having me take my mic off mute, though. You know, this, this event in history is the reason that history is measured like it is. I know it's measured from the birth of Jesus, but time would not have grabbed that marker had not Jesus resurrected from the dead. We measure time based on Jesus Christ. All the world does. Doesn't matter what religion that, that nation is predominant in, they measure time based on Jesus Christ. I want to invite prayer teams to come and just be available this morning. If, if you need prayer for anything, if you want someone just to agree with you concerning something, people will be up here to do that. The benediction is 1 Peter 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. God bless you, saints. Have a great, great week.